and I'll start the normal record, shall I? Yep. All right, one more person to admit. Do you want to admit that person? Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us on this February lecture of Astronomy Ireland. I'm David Moore, the founder of the Society and editor of our magazine, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a moment. First of all, our format for the evening is simply we have a little bit of news about what's been happening in Astronomy Ireland in the past month since our last lecture. Uh, then, of course, our big event, our speaker, Dr. Steph Merritt who's going to talk about the outer solar system. And then a few announcements about what to see in the future. The comet is coming. We're planning uh, events in March. Our evening classes are only all things like that. So do bear with us after the talk at the Q&A. But if you have to rush off, you'll find lots more on our website, astronomy.ie. So it's great to welcome people from all around the 32 counties. We are a national organization, indeed. We think Astronomy Island is the world's most popular astronomy society. So you're in good company if you're already a member. If you're not, you're missing out. So do join at astronomy.ie. We'd love to have everybody on the island, members of the society. There's so much happening out there in space. 2020 was actually our 30th anniversary year. So we've been going over three decades now. A membership will cost you about around about a euro a week. And you'll get our fantastic magazine posted to you every month. Uh, it'll tell you what to see in the sky from Ireland and also report what people have been seeing all around the country, especially this comet. Some people have sent in beautiful Irish photographs. The internet's a buzz with all the international ones. Uh, I've been able to see it with the naked eye la uh, last week and with, bin with binoculars last night. And I see we have clear skies over much of Ireland tonight, so you'll be able to see it. I'll tell you where to see it after our main talk. And there's a great article giving a guide and a star map showing where to find it for the rest of February. So that will actually be emailed to you instantly if you join this month as a special treat so that people can find the comet straight away. Still visible in binoculars, quite easy last night. Uh, so do bear with us and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. Um, as well as the monthly magazine, for members only, we have a weekly email that reminds them of things to see and reports new things to see as well. There are these lectures which, by the way, you can also get on DVD and online going back uh, several months and on DVD several years. There's some very interesting talks over the past few decades. We also run evening classes twice a year, usually in February and October. Our latest one started on February 1st. You can enroll now. Each one of the eight classes is self-contained, so you don't have to. They don't build on each week. So each one, you can just join the classes at any stage up till Easter. And in fact, if you do that now, we'll actually let you repeat the classes in October free of charge. So if you've just missed the start, don't worry about it. Sign up now. Uh, but they're by far the most popular evening classes in Ireland. Thousands of people have taken them to date. And our new tutor since last year is John Campbell, who's a YouTube astronomer with his own 50,000 following. And we've been getting great reports back from all the people listening in on his classes that he's giving for Astronomy Ireland. So do check that out on astronomy.ie. We also run watches with telescopes, and we did that for this comet on January 25th. In fact, we always do an event exactly one week before our evening classes begin. Normally, it's for whatever's on view and to remind people the classes are starting in one week's time. But this year, we actually had the moon near Jupiter. Uh, but more importantly, this comet had appeared as if to herald the evening classes. And it was a clear night. So hundreds of people came along. They all got to see the comet and Jupiter and the moon and Mars as well. And hopefully you were there and you got to look through the giant telescopes and signed up for the classes the following week. The other thing we have is a huge event every summer called Starbecue, the biggest star party in Ireland every year. 500 to 1,000 people come along, dozens of giant telescopes, dark sky in the Wicklow Mountains. Uh, it's happening on the 9th of the 9th this year. Nice, easy date to remember, September the 9th. You, you can check it out on our events page on astronomy.ie. We also have a huge media presence. Uh, we've been doing lots with the media over the last month. We've had 
uh, near miss asteroid uh, 2023 bu from the radio about that aliens were spotted in the south of ireland i kid you not uh, you could check all this out on astronomy.ie slash audio where a lot of our radio recordings are recorded for you to listen back to uh, you may have just noticed before the meeting began if you're outside i was out taking a few quick snaps of it but venus and jupiter in the evening sky and they're closing in so it's a spectacular sight over the next two weeks or so until they're closest on march 1st i'll remind you about that after the talk and don't forget our ne uh, these talks normally happen on the second monday of the month all year round so our next one is set for March the 13th. It's about something very interesting to do with the, the universe and the problem that we might have with it. More on that after our main speaker this evening. So we're going to get you to keep your questions till the end. You can pop them into the chat box or we'll ask you to turn your microphone on and ask them in person uh, as well if you're not shy. Keep that in mind and make plenty of notes if you've got questions to ask. Let me introduce our speaker who's going to talk about the outer solar system. Uh, Dr. Steph Merritt is a research fellow at the Astrophysics Research Centre at Queen's University, Belfast, where they divide their time between solar system science and exoplanets. There's a fantastic group of solar system scientists up there in Queen's who've given us many talks over the years. Uh, she's cur sorry, they're currently developing open source software in preparation for the unprecedented legacy survey of space and time on the Vera C. Rubin telescope, which is expected to see first light next year. And that's going to be an incredible survey, expected to find millions of new solar system objects and revolutionize our understanding of the solar system's formation and history. Uh, we've had talks about that in the past. I'm sure we'll have more. It's going to be an amazing facility when it opens up. Uh, I think the most powerful or biggest camera ever built, at, especially to look at the universe in our case, which is fantastic news. However, after leaving school with no qualifications, Dr. Merritt worked for several uh, entry-level jobs for years before deciding to re-enter education and become an astronomer. There's hope for us all. Uh, she got a, sorry, they got a first class MSc degree in physics and astrophysics from Queen's University, but that's where she, they also did their PhD as well, studying the atmospheres of huge close orbiting exoplanets known as hot Jupiters. And tonight they're going to talk to us about what's out there beyond the outer planets. So um, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Steph Merritt. Over to you, Steph. Thank you, David, for that introduction. That was great. Uh, just share my screen here. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes, that's great. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. I'm really excited to give this talk. It's one I've given a couple of times before, and it's one I absolutely love giving. So today I'm going to be talking to you about the furthest reaches of our solar system with a special focus on the pervasive idea of a hidden planet out there in the coldest, distant, most, furth most far away reaches of our solar system. So I'm going to start with the planet X theory, which led to the discovery of Pluto in 1930. Then I'm going to move on to the trans-Neptunian objects, the kind of realm of asteroids and comets out beyond Neptune where Pluto dwells. Then I'll discuss the discovery of Eris, which led to the uh, somewhat controversial reclassification of Pluto as a dwarf planet in 2006. And then I'm going to talk about the discovery of the dwarf planet Sedna, which led to the unexpected re-emergence of the Planet X theory, now called Planet Nine. I'll cover the evidence for Planet Nine's existence, uh, touch on the search, uh, the attributes we believe it has, and I'm also going to talk about whether the evidence for its existence is truly evidence at all, and if Planet Nine actually exists. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk about how the Planet Nine mystery might be solved by the Legacy Survey of Space and Time at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And I'll also mention how you guys can get involved in the search for Planet Nine or for distant worlds in our backyard. So, Neptune, we're going to start right at the beginning here. Neptune was discovered in 1846. Astronomers knew there had to be another planet out there beyond Uranus because Uranus did not orbit the way we expected. We'd run the calculations and it just, there had to be something else out there, another planet whose gravitational influence was pulling on Uranus. And this led to the discovery of Neptune. 
However, the calculations were run two years afterwards and Uranus's orbit still appeared to be discrepant. So you had astronomers like Babinet in 1848 theorizing a ninth planet beyond Neptune as well. There had to be something else out there, and this is what they called Planet X. So in the grand tradition of uh, very rich people funding astronomical enterprises simply because they can, the businessman Percival Lowell founded the Lowell Observatory in 1906, and he founded this just to search for Planet X. So this is him here sitting in the observer's chair. That's a uh, 24-inch refractor telescope at his observatory. And, you know, it's definitely a more useful project than, say, firing your car into space, naming no names. So Percival Lowell's planet X, he believed that it would have a mass around about half that of Neptune. He was expecting it to have low density, like a gas giant. He was expecting it to show disc, a disc or rings, again, like the gas giants, with an arc, uh, a diameter of one arc second. And he was expecting an apparent magnitude of 12 to 13. So as you probably know, 6.5 is the limit of the naked eye, like golf scores, the higher the worse. So... 12 to 13 is not visible to the naked eye, but was definitely within the realms of what he thought he would be able to find with his telescope. Unfortunately, uh, Percival Lowell died before his uh, beloved Planet X could be discovered. However, in 1929, a young astronomer, Clyde Tombaugh, who was a 22-year-old former farm boy, was hired by the Lowell Observatory to continue the search. So Tombaugh took pairs of images of the same areas of the night sky separated by a few days and examined them using something called a blink comparator. That's a machine that very quickly would exchange one of these photographic plates for another one. And then you would look very carefully to see if anything was moving from plate to plate. This is absolutely painstaking work. It took him nearly a year. I think he looked over thousands upon thousands of image plates, but um, his discovery was his effort was rewarded. That's Pluto there discovered in 1930. And you can just about see there's an arrow pointing to it. There's a dot there. And then a few days later, it's moved. And that was the discovery of Pluto. However, Pluto did not follow Percival Lowell's predictions for planet X. It was too dim for a start. It was only about 15th magnitude. Now, as mass had a originally been calculated based on what we assumed its effect on the orbit of Uranus was. So roughly the mass of the Earth. However, we then had to keep revising it down, especially when it was discovered that it had a moon. So here you can see this blob here. This is Pluto, and it's got a kind of extension, which is gone in the next image. That's its moon, Charon. And when you've got two bodies orbiting each other, it makes it much easier to determine a mass. This brought the mass of Pluto down to less than 0.25% the mass of Earth, which is not the kind of mass you would expect to have much gravitational influence on a planet as large as Uranus. And then finally, Voyager 2 flew by Neptune in 1989. We got much better data on the orbit of Neptune. We revised its mass by 0.5%. And when the calculations were rerun, it turned out Uranus's orbit was no longer discrepant. It was orbiting exactly the way we thought it should be. And this appeared to be the death of the Planet X theory, for now. However, Pluto wasn't all that was out there. So many astronomers, including Edgeworth and Kuiper, suggested that there was a reservoir of comets and larger bodies existing beyond the planets that we knew. They thought that something out there was acting as a source of all the comets that we see coming into our solar system and then back out again. However, because these objects are so far away and so small, the second trans-Neptunian object, which is 15760 Albion, wasn't discovered until 1992. And that was by Dave C. Dewar and Jane X. Liu after a five-year search. And immediately, just to show how pervasive this idea is, Albion was declared to be Planet X by the media. Unfortunately, uh, a few years later, we found a bunch more TNOs and people very quietly stopped calling it Planet X. Uh, but now uh, we know that of the existence of thousands of trans-Neptunian objects. There's surveys like Ossos discovering 800 objects beyond Neptune alone. So you may notice that the illustration here calls it the Kuiper Belt. I'm not going to call it the Kuiper Belt. Kuiper was one of many, many astronomers who suggested that this region full of small bodies might exist. He certainly wasn't the first. And 
the Irishman Edgeworth was probably the first astronomer to really nail down what he thought it was. So Edgeworth Kuiper Belt, probably a better name for it. So in this diagram here, the bottom is a log scale. So one AU is the distance between the sun and the earth. And then the next tick up is 10 times that distance. So we're multiplying by 10 each time. So you can see Neptune here. And then we have the Kuiper Belt where Pluto is right on the edge. And this is full of small bodies which are either in a resonant orbit with Neptune or they're affected somehow by Neptune's orbit. That's from 30 to 50-ish AU. Out beyond that, we have a fainter kind of region, which is scattered disk objects. These are objects on sort of strange elliptical orbits because they've kind of been scattered outwards by the giant planets onto these unusual orbits. And that extends up until about 100 AU. And then out beyond the scattered disk objects, we have what we call the detached objects or extreme trans-Neptunian objects. Remember these because we're going to come back to them later. Sometimes they're said to be in the inner Oort cloud. This is a controversial term, not just because it's... Again, Oort wasn't the only astronomer. It's often sometimes called the opic Oort cloud, but also because where the Oort cloud begins and ends is an open question in astronomy. But we do know that round about 5,000 AU, you have the Oort cloud, which becomes spherical. What's the Oort cloud? I'm only going to go into this very briefly because... The Oort cloud is a theoretical construct. It was discovered that the Kuiper belt and the scattered disk can only explain short period comets on orbits which are roughly in the plane of the solar system. A lot of comets don't follow those restrictions. They'll come in from all sorts of directions on all kinds of orbits. So Opik and Oort theorized that there would be a spherical mass of small bodies of ice and rocks surrounding the entire solar system way out at 2,000 to 100,000 AU, and that this would be the source of long period comets. It would contain billions of objects, absolutely billions, very loosely linked to the solar system by the sun's gravity. Unfortunately, we have absolutely no observational evidence that the opic Oort cloud exists, and we're not likely to get it either. It's so far out, and these objects are so small and so dim that it would be a tremendous endeavor uh, to kind of put it into context, even the voyagers won't get there for another 300 years. It's extremely far out. So with the discovery of the trans-Neptunian objects, our understanding of the outer solar system was beginning to grow. And it seems that Planet X is a theory that we find very, very difficult to let go of. This is Eris, so we should play a video here. Yeah, excellent. So Eris is a dwarf planet discovered in 2005 at Palomar Observatory by Mike Brown. Remember Mike Brown's name, he's going to come up again. Now, you can just about see it moving here in a series of images very, very slowly. And it has a moon, Dysnomia, and it appeared slightly larger than Pluto. So Eris orbits at 67 AU, so 67 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun. So that's much further out even than Pluto, very, very distant planet. And of course, uh, the media, NASA, everyone immediately began to refer to Eris as the 10th planet. We love this concept. However, Eris was not alone. We've actually found several of these large, rounded, planet-like TNOs and many have their own moons. So we found uh, Haumea here in 2004 with its two moons and its very strange elongated shape due to its very fast spin. There's Make Make and its moon. And there's a bunch of them, uh, Gongong, Quara, Sedna, Orcus, Salacia, the very snappily named 2002 MS4. Pluto, it seems, was no longer a lonely planet. It wasn't all by itself on the very edge of our solar system. It had a whole bunch of friends out there. And it seemed to be part of a system, in fact, of suspiciously similar looking bodies. And as it happened, we'd seen something like this before in astronomy. This is Ceres. Ceres was discovered in 1801 by Giuseppe Piazzi in between Mars and Jupiter. And I'm sure you guys know what's between Mars and Jupiter. Ceres was originally classified as a planet. It was classified as a planet in the solar system, but it was reclassified as an asteroid in the 1950s on the discovery of many similar objects in its vicinity, the asteroid belt. So this is probably sounding very familiar. 
And this kind of triggered an argument as to whether Pluto should also undergo this kind of reclassification. These arguments really did come to a head with the discovery of Eris, and they led eventually to the reclassification of Pluto. So the International Astronomical Union finally did decide they need a definition for what a planet actually is in 2006. Before this, a planet was whatever we said it was. Now we have a definition. And in that definition, there is, well, the definitions are, first of all, it has to orbit the sun. I have a problem with this as it rules out exoplanets, but never mind. Second of all, it should have formed a spherical shape under the influence of its own gravity. So far, so good for Pluto. But the third classification was the one that really ruled it out as a planet. It must have cleared its own orbit. Pluto has not cleared its own orbit. Pluto exists with a whole bunch of friends out there. All of the trans-Neptunian objects, it's in a quite busy part of the solar system, like Ceres in the asteroid belt. I want to point out I had nothing to do with this. I was 19 at the time. I hadn't even thought of becoming an astronomer yet. It did cause a lot of controversy and a lot of anger from various places, but eventually it led to the reclassification of Pluto, Eris, others like it as dwarf planets. And we have the lovely kind of New Horizons image of Pluto and its moon Sharon here. This is not to, to scale at all. Um, and it led to Mike Brown, the discoverer of Eris, uh, to call himself the man who killed Pluto, which is nice if you can put it on your CV, I guess. So not only was Eris not the 10th planet, we no longer had a ninth planet. So was this the nail in the coffin for the planet X theory? <laughs> of course it wasn't. So this is the curious case of Sedna, artist's impression here, and an actual image, much less exciting, here. So Sedna was discovered in 2003, also by Mike Brown, uh, named after the Inuit goddess of the sea, who is thought to live at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. 76 AU at closest approach to the sun, 937 AU at its most distant, or 4.3 light days. It has a 12,000 year orbit. It's very far out. And Sedna has been called the most scientifically important trans-Neptunian object. It's got a really strange orbit. So if you look here, you can see this is a top-down view of the solar system. So you can just about see in blue there you have Neptune and in purple that's Pluto's orbit. Sedna has an incredibly elliptical eccentric orbit. And if you look at the side view there, you can also see it's tilted. It's inclined. So this is strange and unusual. And you might ask why? Because planets form from a flat disk. This is an artist's impression here. We have a star. And then around it, you have this great big disk of dust and gas and material. And it's this disk that dust that planets are formed from. So this is a few images of planetary systems in the making from ALMA. You can see the flat disk at every single one. You can see kind of the gaps in them too, where planets have formed and kind of sucked up all of the uh, material there. So that's cool, but it does mean that these flat rotating disks mean that you would expect planets to uh, orbit on a flat plane with a circular orbit. For an for a object to not do that, something must have disturbed it. Something has pushed or pulled it out of the circular flat orbit we'd expect. And the thing about Sedna is it's so far away that there's no way that any of the planets in our solar system that we know of could have done it. It's too far away. It's not close enough to even Neptune to be under its gravitational influence. Eventually, six of these extreme trans-Neptune objects like Sedna were found. And they had curiously aligned orbits. So if you look here at another top-down view, here's Sedna's orbit, and then we found a few more. And as you'll notice, they're all to one side. I can show a video here, which also gives an idea of the distances involved. So we have the terrestrial planets. We zoom out to the giant planets, nice circular orbits here. We zoom out again, and then there, Sedna, the other trans-Neptunian objects. And this, is the theory. Constantin Batigin and again, Mike Brown in 2006 proposed 
a hypothetical planet nine. This planet nine was responsible for shepherding the orbits of these extreme trans-Neptunian objects. Its gravitational influence is essentially pushing them to the other side. So what are the properties of this theoretical planet nine? Well, from its gravitational influence, we could have a guess at the mass. So it's theorized to have 6.2 times the mass of the Earth, uh, a radius of 2.4 times Earth, so it's a little smaller than Neptune. Its orbit is a semi-major axis of 300 to 520 AU, and one planet nine year is theorized to be 10,000 to 20,000 years. In a kind of structure, it's theorized to be much like Neptune. You've got a large hydrogen helium kind of gas envelope, then some ices, and then a silicate mantle and iron core in the middle. It's hard to pin down an exact location, although a rough location has been theorized, but we think probably somewhere near Orion. So here's Orion here, there's Betelgeuse. And this is its kind of one of its many proposed orbits. So it would be around here, but this is how slowly it moves as well. Like in a thousand years, it will have moved this far in the night sky. It's theorized apparent magnitude is greater than 22, which would make it 600 times fainter than Pluto. It's incredibly dim. So where did it come from? And this is the interesting question. If there is a planet out there, it can't have formed out there. If we go back to the planetary disk, as you can see, it's kind of thicker in the center and then it gets kind of less dense and fainter as you get further away from the sun. In fact, the disk of matter, there's no way it could have been dense enough at the edge to form a giant planet out here. It must have got there through some other means. So I'll go through a few of the theories of how Planet Nine might have come out there. So the first one is after the giant planets were formed, there was a period when they were kind of migrating around. We know this because as they were doing it, they pushed quite a lot of material on strange orbits. The Kuiper Belt is kind of flared. And we believe that's because of the giant planets kind of pushing material outwards. So it's possible that Planet Nine could have formed somewhere in the middle, in a nice normal expected place between Saturn and Uranus. And then during that period of upheaval, it just ping-ponged right out and ended up on a very strange orbit. Another theory is that it was in one of these normal circular orbits. And then another star came along and then just pulled it right out again. This is an interesting theory because we know that the sun was originally part of a much denser star region than it is today. So there used to be way more stars in our neighborhood than there are today. So there's justification for this theory. There would have been more stars passing early in the solar system's lifetime. Another theory is that we just captured it from another system, again, during this period when we were closer to other stars. Another system passed by and we just yanked that planet out and it went on its merry way. So if we have all these theories as to where planet nine is, what it might look like, how bright it is, where in the sky it is, how it got there, all these theories that we've come up with, why haven't we found it yet? Now we've looked, Vatican and Brown have searched archival data from so many surveys, the Catalina Sky Survey, PanStars, WISE Satellite, the first three years of data from the Zwicky Transient Facility. If it's been looking at the sky, they have gone through the archival data and they have not found Planet Nine. They have ruled out 56% of potential locations. They're currently using the Subaru telescope, which is here, a Japanese run telescope on in Hawaii. And they're using that to observe 600 to 800 square degrees of sky, again, near Orion. But the thing is, whether Planet Nine is actually real is very much an open question. If you ask an astronomer, you will get either 90% sure it doesn't exist, 90% sure it does. It's split us right down the middle. So for a start, there's more than one explanation for why we might see these clustered extreme trans-Neptunian objects. That passing star I mentioned earlier would also certainly have the gravitational influence necessary to tug some objects into these aligned elliptical orbits. There's also a phenomenon called galactic tides, where the galaxy itself has its own gravitational tides that could have pulled them outwards. But I think probably the most pervasive piece of evidence against Planet Nine existing is the theory that this 
clustering of extreme trans-Neptunian objects actually doesn't exist. It's caused by observational bias. Observational bias is very simply the concept that we are more likely to see what is easiest for us to see. So in the very simple way, we're in the Northern Hemisphere. We only see the Northern Hemisphere sky. That's a bias. Um, we also What we see in the sky also depends on the time of year. Uh, if you're using an amateur uh, telescope out in your back garden, you're, you're going to have a hard limit on how bright the things you can observe are. And the more complex the telescope, the more complex the optics, the more complex these observational biases can become. So the theory is that we saw these clustered objects simply because objects in that particular orbit are easiest for us to see. And Brown and Batigan's six objects all came from a bunch of different surveys where these observational biases just weren't very well understood. So a group of scientists run by Cavalars et al. analyzed all of these surveys, analyzed the observational biases as best they could, and they found that there was no clustering at all. Large sky surveys like OSSOS or the Dark Energy Survey with well-known accounted for observational biases also didn't find the expected orbital clustering. And you can actually see here, so it's quite hard to see, but the bright green one is the proposed orbit of Planet Nine. Every other orbit here is an extreme trans-Neptunian object. We've added more to the count. So there were six. There's now, I think, 14 on this plot. Suddenly, this clustering isn't looking so definitive anymore. However, I want to point out two things. First of all, this is very small number statistics. We would really need a much larger population of extreme trans-Neptunian objects for us to judge whether we are seeing a real clustering. Second of all, uh, Mike Brown and Constantin Batigan did also perform a reanalysis themselves, and they still think there is, I think they said 99% certainty that the clustering is real. You might think, oh, well, they would say that, but they're good scientists. So I would say this is still very much up in the air as of now. So how are we going to solve the mystery of Planet Nine? And how are we going to probe into the furthest reaches of our solar system? So the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which is currently being built in Cerro Patron in Chile, is due to see first light in, you will see I have to revise the date on this several times, now 2025. So I believe my introduction said next year. That was true when I sent my bio. We are now looking at 2025. Like all big astronomical projects, there's been delays. COVID set us back a huge amount. But when we get going, the legacy survey space and time, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory is going to be incredible. It's an absolutely unprecedented attempt to map our night skies. It's a 10-year full sky survey. It's going to go down to 27th magnitude. It's going to revolutionize our understanding of so many different things. Um, the transient and supernova community are interested. The dark energy community are interested. The galactic community are interested. And the solar system community. Like, we're super excited. So the Vera C. Rubin Observatory has an eight meter primary mirror. It's field of view here. You can fit seven of the moon in it. And at 24 kilometers, its resolution is high enough that it can image a single golf ball which is amazing. It has a megapixel camera array over one meter wide. This is the largest digital camera in the world. I was hoping to find a picture with a person standing in there, but it's absolutely enormous. And it's going to produce 20,000 images and 1.28 petabytes of data. It's an absolutely remarkable endeavor. So let's have a look at what it's actually going to discover. These are the currently known objects. So Near-Earth objects, that's the dangerous bits near the Earth that we like to monitor to make sure none of, the bus are going, none of them are going to hit us and cause an Armageddon scenario. Main belt asteroids in the asteroid belt, Jupiter Trojans. These are the guys that kind of follow Jupiter around in his orbit. And here we have the trans-Neptunian objects and scattered disk objects, currently known around 3,000, so roughly the same number as comets. The LSST is predicted to discover... 40,000 new trans-Neptunian and scattered disk objects. This is enormous. We're going to be able to do population studies that we've never been able to do before. I mean, that's without even getting into how many more main belt asteroids it's going to discover. This is really, truly going to be an impressive survey. However, 
We do not have nearly enough PhD students in the world to do this the old fashioned way. If you remember, Clyde Tombaugh had his blink comparator and he was looking between two plates to see if anything was moving between the plates. With all our data, with all the images we're taking, there's absolutely no way we can do that. We have an automated pipeline. This automated pipeline is going to detect moving objects for us and link them together. And this is a clever little thing and it's really impressive and necessary. So say you have an object and on the first night you see it move this much. Maybe on night two, you see it move from here to here, to here, to here. And on night three, it moves from here to here. The automated pipeline uh, spots all these uh, moving objects and forms what it calls tracklets, potentially linked objects in the same night. So it goes, I think this might be the same object. I think these two might be the same object, these two and these two. And then it links all of these tracklets together with a track, which is these sets of tracklets formed over at least three nights. Once it's found something like this, it can compute an orbit all by itself, and then it can send the orbital data to the Minor Planet Center for classification. So a human doesn't have to get involved at all, which is good because otherwise we would be going through the data from this for millennia. But the important question here is, will the LSST find Planet Nine? Well, on the left here, this is a map of the night sky. And below this yellow line here is, in the darker gray, is the night sky that the LSST can see from Chile. And this band here of kind of blue, green, and yellow these are the potential locations of Planet Nine as calculated by simulation. And as you can see, the bulk of the predicted Planet Nine locations lie within the LSST's footprint. However, it may be too faint. It's currently predicted to be about 700 AU away. It also may be moving too slowly. If you remember on the previous slide, the automated software is looking for things that move in the space of a night. Planet Nine is probably moving so slowly that it won't appear to move in the space of a night. It will appear completely stationary. So one of the projects I'm working on is to actually build an open source accessible pipeline for astronomers, anyone to use, that will actually be able to detect objects that move over the course of a few days or even weeks. However, even if we can't find Planet Nine, what we will find are a ton more extreme trans-Neptunian objects. And the LSST, its observational biases are extremely well understood. Even before we have first light on the telescope, we kind of know what we can and can't see with it. This is something else I've spent a lot of time working on and simulating. So we will be able to look at these extreme trans-Neptunian objects. We will be able to account for our observational biases and we will be able to rule out or rule in this orbital clustering that we believe or some of us believe, is caused by Planet Nine. However, 2025 is still a couple of years away, and it is a 10-year survey. It could take us 10 years to find these extreme trans-Neptunian objects. That's a long time to wait. So in case you'd like to get involved yourself in the search for Planet Nine, this is Backyard Worlds. So Backyard Worlds is a Zooniverse project where citizen scientists can examine data from the... I've completely forgotten what the satellite's called. Oh, that's it. WISE. So it's NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. So volunteers can get super quickly started on this. You don't need any astronomical experience. There's a tutorial. You're simply shown data like this, and you're looking for moving objects like this or dipoles, which just kind of seem to flash back and forth. So this is a really fantastic way for citizen scientists to get involved. Even if you're not finding Planet Nine, you're looking for strange things out there in the far reaches of our solar system, strange things passing by, brown dwarfs. And the contribution that citizen scientists actually make cannot be understated. We use citizen scientists and Zooniverse and exoplanets as well. And the simple reason for this is that human beings are still much better at pattern recognition than computers. Much better. There are citizen scientists out there who have gotten their names on astronomical papers because they have discovered an exoplanet, because they have discovered something interesting. So if it's if you feel like it's something you want to get involved with, I would absolutely recommend you do it. Like I said, it's very easy. You don't need to be an expert. There's a tutorial. And 
as astronomers, I can say we're very grateful for the help. We used to make PhD students do this kind of stuff, but they tend to rebel because they seem to think they've got more important things to do. <laughs> so that's mostly the end of my talk. Uh, in conclusion, there's still an awful lot we don't know about the furthest reaches of our solar system. And whether Planet Nine truly exists is an open question. The upcoming Legacy Survey of Space and Time on the Vera C. Rubin Telescope is going to hugely increase our understanding of this still mysterious realm out beyond Neptune, and perhaps either find or disprove Planet Nine once and for all. And you can also get involved with the search yourself. That's everything I've got. I'm really happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Steph. Uh, I might kick off the questions myself, if I dare. Sure. Actually, before I do that, I forgot to mention that our last lecture was our New Year lecture, all about the James Webb Space Telescope. And it was actually about uh, uh, planets as well, another solar system talk. And people can get that on our website, astronomy.ie. You'll see them all there. You can watch it streaming online. You can actually get it on DVD posted to you. So we do watch out for that. I have one other announcement to make, which was, uh, oh, yes, that Mike Brown himself did give a talk. And it was last year um, to the Society as well. Do you work closely with him? That's not my first question for Um, He is my boss's former PhD supervisor. <laughs> so, so we're all connected in the outer solar system stuff. Great. And my actual real question was, um, we'll be monitoring the chat box for anybody else who wants to ask a question. Or feel free, after Steph's answered the question, just to unmute your microphone and shout out your question. There's usually not that many people, so I don't think there'll be a big crowd roaring up. At us. My question was about the on the citizen science thing, dipoles. What are they compared to the movers? So some of the what's the easiest way? Okay. The images they show you on backyard worlds have had the background subtracted. So they've tried to subtract the night sky, the stationary night sky. If an object is moving very slowly, this background subtraction causes it to not look like a moving object, but instead to kind of look like it's blinking back and forth. It's just a product of uh, what we do to remove any background objects to make anything moving easier to see. So it's kind of a symptom of that. Ah, good, yeah. And I see a question in there from Anton. Uh, can you see the questions yourself? Steph, I can, you yes, I can see them. Okay, so what's the best way to get involved with the open source work as a developer rather than an astronomer? I get this question a lot. I think it's fantastic. Um, so unfortunately, and I disagree with this entirely, it's very difficult to get into astronomical software development if you don't have a PhD in astronomy. I think this is wrong. I mostly work in software development for astronomy, and I had to teach myself. What we really need are people who are experienced software developers. However, the LSST does hire open source does hire developers and if you are interested in working on open source software um, as a developer there are open source projects so if you know python there's a library called astropy which is always desperate for people to help out fixing bugs um adding new functionality things like that then it has a github repository if you're interested in that um but otherwise, it can be quite hard to get involved as a developer. And I don't agree with that. I think we need more developers in, in, in astronomy rather than just people like me who are astronomers who kind of taught themselves and are probably terrible at it. But aside from volunteer projects like AstroPi or actually getting a job that does this, those are the only things I can really think of. Great. Uh, we have another question from PC. Before we take that, just to remind people, after the Q&A session, we will tell you where to see the new comet ZTF and also what's happening in the sky. Venus and Jupiter getting very close together. So do stay with us. It'll only be a couple of minutes if you have to rush off. It's Most of it is in the magazine. But I want to get a link up into the chat box as well with the map that we have of where the comet's going to be over the next few nights. But I see PC has asked, can something like JWT help in the search? Probably not, simply because the James Webb is not a survey telescope. It's designed to point at things where we know something exists. The time 
JWST time is too valuable to spend pointing it at things where we don't know something exists, if that makes sense. Generally, survey telescopes are dedicated simply to one survey. Getting time on the JWST is difficult, even if you do know what you're looking at. Getting the JWST to stare at a blank patch of sky is just not going to happen. We don't have the location of Planet Nine narrowed down nearly enough. They would absolutely not give us time for that, unfortunately. And then, uh, you, can you see Thomas Finning in question there? How, How are scientists, are... go ahead. How are scientists able to predict the molecular composition of Planet Nine when we don't know that it exists? That's an incredible question. It's a very good question too. We can't. We are going purely off guesswork here. I probably shouldn't call it guesswork, theoretical work, let's say. If it formed in our solar system, we, we know what our solar system planets are made of. From that, we have a good guess at what the disk was made of. So we're basically guessing. If we know its mass, we can have a rough idea of its density. From that, we know that if it's a little smaller than Neptune, it's probably a gas giant. And then we would expect its molecular composition to be roughly the same as Neptune. And that's purely what scientists are going on when they guess at the molecular composition of Planet Nine. Of course, if we did, in fact, steal Planet Nine from another solar system, all of this goes out of the window because that system may have had a completely different metallicity. But again, it's very much best guess. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and answer the next question then. So there's a question here from Sandra. Why is it so important to find Planet X other than pure curiosity? That's a <laughs> that's an interesting question. You mean, one might argue, why is it important to look for anything else out there? I think it's almost a, a drive in us in that we want to understand our neighborhood. We want to know what's around us. We want to know how the solar system took the form that it did. We want to know its history. We want to, it's our home. We want to understand it better. So I think our search to understand whether planet X exists and where it might be, I think that's where it comes from. And the thing is, if it doesn't exist and we do see this orbital clustering, we're still going to want to know why. Astronomers, like all scientists, really, really hate an unanswered question. So I hope that's okay as an answer. Yeah, uh, just before we go to the next question, I said I'd have that link, the special map that we sent out just to the members last week. Uh, so if you look in the chat box, it should be a clickable link now. It'll show you where the comet is for the next few nights anyway. But did I see a question? Yeah, a question from Mick Don. Uh, what a great talk. Uh, here, here. <laughs> Will we ever be able to see the Oort cloud? Thank you, Mick. Um, it is a good question. I don't know if we could build an observation platform large enough to see objects in the Oort cloud. I haven't run the numbers myself, but I think at this point you would be looking at something like interferometers built out in space, like absolutely ridiculously expensive, wonderful facilities if we could have them. So I don't want to rule it out completely. I don't want to put a limit on human ingenuity, but I am not sure we will ever specifically be able to see anything from the Oort cloud, which is a shame because it's, it's fascinating to me that we know it's out there, but we'll never be able to see it. But no, I don't think we ever will. I'm uh, just trying to see. I don't see any other questions coming. If anyone wants to shout out a question, please do. Or we might close the Q&A there and tell you about the comet. Give them a few seconds sometimes to shy or they're probably furiously typing. <laughs> In which case they should unmute their microphone and ask that way. I do have to leave us, Steph. Are you hanging on? I know a lot of... I'll hang on for the rest of the talks. Okay. Well, well if have anyone has any questions, throw them into the chat box while I'm briefly telling people about the comet. Hopefully you can all click on that link which shows the position of the comet uh, in Irish skies at 10 o'clock Irish time uh, every night. And if you're looking at it and you know the lovely V-shaped Hyades star cluster, uh, Mars is just above it at the moment. Mars lovely and bright. That's marked on the map as well. You'll see that tonight, but especially tomorrow's night, as a Valentine's treat 
<laughs> the comment's going to be very close to Aldebaran, uh, one of the first magnitude stars. Easy to see. So if you get your binoculars, uh, you'll be able to see the comet in the same field of view as Aldebaran tonight, because I could see it just about in the same field of view last night. Uh, so tonight will definitely be in the same field of view and very close tomorrow night. And if that's cloudy, the night after, they'll still be in the same field of view. And even the 16th of February, you can see down there at the bottom, you would probably be able to squeeze Aldebaran and the comet into the field of view. The comet's fading now as it moves away from the Earth. It was closest on the evening of February 1st. It did break naked eye magnitude. So I did see it once with the Irish weather, with the naked eye, very faintly, much easier in binoculars. Binoculars are about, oh, 100 times more powerful than your eye. In fact, I've got a little pair here, if I turn my video back on. There we go. A little pair of binoculars like these, you'll see marked on them is a 10x50. And that simply means they magnify 10 times. And these lenses are 50 millimeters across. And that's collecting about 50 times more light than your eyes do. So that, they're quite powerful little telescopes for about 20 quid, in fact, less than 20 quid these days. So that's certainly the first thing to invest in uh, once you start looking around the sky and want to see something more. And the comet, it's not often we can see a comet with the naked eye at all, or even in binoculars. Uh, there was comet Neowise back in during lockdown in July 2020. If you were trapped in a city and not allowed travel, ah, you would have had great difficulty seeing it. But it was as bright as the brightest stars in the sky. So you would have seen at least a bit of it. But out in the countryside, uh, we claim to be journalists since we publish a magazine. So we could actually travel. And the police uh, guardy were quite interested in us. But when we explained what we were doing, that we're journalists, we got away with it. And you may remember back, I think it was the September issue of 2020, that comet featured on the front cover of the magazine. Hopefully you're all members back then. There'll be other comets around. And this comet, you can see on that map, is fading slowly. It'll stay visible in binoculars till the end of February. Uh, so do enjoy it over the next few nights. Uh, that's, that's a little bit about the comet. Uh, the other thing I can just tell you is, of course, if you have the magazine or if you sign up tonight, on page 29 of and 28 of your February magazine, we do have a double page spread explaining how to see it, what to look out for, like the time it passes near Mars a few days ago, Aldebaran. Uh, over the next few nights, a lovely star map and lots of simple words to explain what to watch out for. So that's been the highlight. There are other things to see. They're all listed in the magazine. What I tell people, the magazine pops through your letterbox. And the first thing you should do, even if you're rushing out the door to work, is go to page 22, the first page of the Sky Diary, and just glance at the highlights box over here. Always do that because you'll see what the main sites to see of the month are and if we look at that oops, i dropped mine on the floor <laughs> if we look at that this month you'll see that the uh, mars is going to pass particularly close to the moon uh on let me get the exact date right it is uh the 27th and 28th of the month uh, it'll just be about two moon diameters away from the moon there's a diagram in the magazine showing what that looks like uh, the, the other thing you're going to see between now and the next lecture, technically it's 1st of March, is Venus and Jupiter getting closer and closer. They were quite nicely placed tonight. They are the two brightest things in the sky, apart from the moon, the night sky. And uh, for those two to get about one moon diameter apart on March the 1st will be really spectacular. They'll be fairly close the night before and after, but they're worth watching now. And as the days pass by, as they get closer and closer and closer and closer until they make this beautiful double planet on March the 1st. So definitely watch out for that. So Mars is well placed in evening skies. Jupiter is beginning to bow out. Venus is coming in. That's why they pass each other over the next few weeks. And check out the magazine for lots of other interesting things. The moon's near the Pleiades star cluster and other stars. And Venus is near Neptune. If you've got a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, it's all in there in the magazine. So before I just close uh, out, let me just have a quick look, see if there are any other um, questions? Nope, good. So we're all good. Uh, I'll just tell you about the next events coming up. Of course, remember that you can do our evening classes. They're running now every Wednesday night. John Campbell, the YouTube astronomer, as we're calling him. 
and he'll tell you everything you ever want to know about the universe, but we're afraid to ask. So do enjoy those. Uh, the, the, we're planning a watch for March the 24th, Friday, during National Astronomy Week. There'll be more about that in the magazine and at the next lecture on Monday the 13th of March. As I said, these talks are monthly, usually the second Monday of the month all year round. And I'll just tell you briefly about the next lecture. It's going to be given by Dr. Owen O'Colgan, who's from the University of Sligo. And there's something very interesting going on in the study of the universe. The Hubble constant is a number that's used to tell us the age of the universe. And there are different techniques for calculating it. And they don't agree. And this could be a big problem for our understanding of the universe. So it's a little bit complicated, but he's going to explain it in simple terms to a lay audience, no background in science. So that's on Monday, the 13th of March at 7 p.m. Sounds like a great talk if you're interested in cosmology, the Big Bang and all that. Uh, you can book tickets for it now on our website, astronomy.ie. So just to close off, uh, don't forget for free, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. When the International Space Station is flying over again in a few days time, we'll have predictions there. If there's any aurora that are predicted to happen, there's some enormous spots on the sun at the moment. And there is a bit of an aurora expected this week. We'll predict it there on our social media. That's free. If you can afford a euro a week, join Astronomy and get the magazine posted to you. Uh, so that's all of our events. Unless there's any you know, there are officers listening in who want to announce anything that I've forgotten about, uh, we'll bring the meeting to a close. No, no 